courtesy of the senator from uh, Illinois. Uh, I want to thank Senator McConnell from Kentucky for his remarks. Uh, one other thing I said in, in, at the funeral for Senator Baker was that uh, Senator Baker had an eye for talent. And I remember in 1969, when I was a young aide in the Nixon White House, uh, Senator Baker came to me and said, you might want to get to know that smart young legislative assistant for Senator Marlo Cook. And that young legislative assistant was Mitch McConnell. And so I did get to know him. I want to thank Senator McConnell for coming to the funeral. And I want to thank Senator Reid, our majority leader, for, for being there as well. They were there um, at the front of that small church in Huntsville, Tennessee. And uh, the vice president came, sat there, uh, met everybody, showed his respect both to former Senator Baker and his wife, uh, former Senator Nancy Kassebaum Baker. And we Tennesseans appreciated that courtesy by the vice president, the majority leader, and the minority leader very much. There were a number of others there. Our governor was there. Senator Corker and I, of course, were there. Former Senators Thompson, the majority leader, Bill Frist, uh, who Senator Baker had mentored, Senator Domenici, Senator Brock, Senator Bennett Johnson uh, were also there. Our former governors, uh, Winfield Dunn and, and Don Sunquist, former Senator Bill Brock was there. It was a small church, uh, but along with former Vice President Al Gore and the current Vice President and the Majority Leader, as well as the Minority Leader, it had real respect for the former majority leader of the Senate. Uh, I will not try to repeat what I said at the funeral. It was a privilege for me to be asked by the family to speak. But I did want to make two comments briefly, one personal and one about the Senate. Uh, the personal one was, and I said there that uh, I had tried to follow the rule in Lamar Alexander's Little Plaid book that when invited to speak at a funeral, remember to mention the deceased more often than yourself and to talk more about Baker than my relationship with him, but that was hard to do. I waited till the end of my remarks to try to do that. No one had more influence on my life over the last half century than Howard Baker. I came here with him in 1967 as his only legislative assistant. That's how many legislative assistants senators had then. Uh, they dealt mainly with one another, not through, not through staff members. And I came back in 1977 when suddenly he was elected Republican leader on his third try uh, by one vote. And I worked in the office that's now the Republican leader's office for three months helping him find a permanent chief of staff until I went back to Tennessee. And throughout my entire public life and private life, no one has had more effect on me by virtue of his effort to encourage me as well as many other younger people who were working their way up in a variety of ways, but as an example for how to, for how to do things. My advice to younger people who want to know how to become involved in politics is find someone whom you respect and admire and volunteer to go to work for them and do anything legal they ask you to do and learn from them, both the good and the bad, and I had the great privilege of of, of working with, with, uh, with, with the best. Now as far, it, and, and just to give one small example of how closely intertwined our times have become, I have the same office he had in the Dirksen office building. I have the same phone number he had in the Dirksen office building. And if you open the drawer of this desk, you'll find scratched in the drawer the names Baker, Thompson, Fred Thompson, and my name, I have the same desk on this floor. Now, as far as the Senate, just one story. I thought a remarkably effective presentation at the funeral was by Martha Ann Fairchild, who for 20 years has been the minister of the small Presbyterian church there in Huntsville. And she told a story about light bulbs and Senator Baker. He was on the session of that church. That's the governing body. He was an elder, and he insisted on coming to the meetings. And she said at one of the meetings, the session, the elders, and there probably aren't, I don't know how many members there are of that church, maybe 70, maybe 100, they fell into a discussion about new light bulbs. 
and it was pretty contentious. And eventually they resolved it because Senator Baker insisted that they discuss it all the way through to the end. And she talked with him later and he said, well, I could have pulled out my checkbook and written a check for the new light bulbs, but I thought it was more important that the elders have a full and long discussion so they all could be comfortable with the decision that they made. That story about light bulbs is how Howard Baker saw the United States Senate, as a forum for extended discussion, where you have the patience to allow everyone to pretty well have their say, in the hopes that you come to a conclusion that most of us are comfortable with, and therefore the country is comfortable with it. He understood you only govern a complex country such as ours by consensus. And whether it was light bulbs, or an eight-week debate on the Panama Canal where there were 200 contentious amendments and reservations and arguments, you, you, you have that discussion all the way through to the end. It is said that these days are much more contentious than the days of Howard Baker. There are some things different today that make that sort of discussion more difficult, but we shouldn't kid ourselves. Those weren't easy days either. Those were the days when Vietnam veterans came home with Americans spitting on them. Those were the days of Watergate. Those were the days of Social Security going bankrupt and an eight-week contentious debate on the Panama Canal. Those were the days of the Equal Rights Amendment. Those were difficult days, too. And Senator Baker and Senator Byrd on the Democratic side were able, generally speaking, for the Senate to take up those big issues have an extended discussion all the way through to the end and come to a result. Most of us, Mr. President, in this body have the same principles. They all belong to what we call the American character. They include such principles as equal opportunity, liberty, e pluribus unum, and most of our conflicts, the late Samuel Huntington used to say, is about resolving those principles. I mean, if you're talking about immigration, you have a debate between rule of law and equal opportunity sometimes. So how do we put those together, and how do we come to a conclusion? Howard Baker saw the way to do that as bringing to the floor uh, a subject, hopefully with bipartisan support, and talking it all the way through to the end until we were comfortable with the decision. And his aid in that was, as Senator McConnell said, being an eloquent listener. That's why he was admired by members of both parties. In one poll in the 1980s, he was considered to be uh, the most admired senator by Democrats and by Republicans. That's why Dan Quayle said, there's Howard Baker and then there's the rest of us senators. So I think the memory of Howard Baker, the lesson for him is that without assigning any blame to the Republican side or the Democratic side, we don't need a change of rules to make this place function. We need a change of behavior. And Howard Baker's behavior is a pretty good example. Whether it was the Panama Canal, whether it was fixing Social Security, whether it was Reagan's tax cuts, or whether it was resolving whether and how to buy new light bulbs in the First Presbyterian Church of Huntsville, Tennessee. Mr. President, I'd like to place into the record the remarks of Martha Ann Fairchild, the pastor of the First Presbyterian Church uh, of Huntsville, Tennessee, as well as two other documents, one by Arthur B. Culverhouse, Jr., who is Senator Baker's uh, legislative assistant, President Reagan's counsel, and whom Howard Baker said to Culverhouse, according to Culverhouse, that if the president truly did not know about the diversion of Iran arms sales proceeds to the countries, he was to help him, if he did not truly, truly know. And then an article by Keel Hunt from the Tennessean uh, about Senator Baker, and finally, the order of the funeral service of worship at the Baker ceremony. I thank uh, the Senate for this time, and I yield the floor to my colleague from Tennessee.